Uh, presentation skills are key in any situation, and we're pleased to have the Master of the Art here with us today to give us the tools we need to present successfully, successfully. Life's a pitch. Please welcome Terry Ward. All right, so welcome. I'm glad, but a lot of people, this is great. Now, uh, you're probably looking at me and thinking, you just saw Robert Redford and I look a little bit like Paul Newman, aren't you? <laughs> that would be really nice if that was true. Uh, before I start, I mean, I've been doing communication skills training, presentation skills training, negotiations, anything really dealing with, with the spoken word. So before I start, I just want to let you know why I've been doing it for so long. Working with companies, and I do a lot of work with DreamWorks, with Mattel, with Disney, with Activision, with Univision. So I do a lot with creative people. And, and the thing I've seen over and over again, there are people that are really, really talented and have great ideas, but they can't really get their ideas across in a way that really inspires and motivates people. So it's, these great ideas kind of fall on, on stone and, and nothing happens with them. And then I see these really slick, slick people, very good at communicating, but their ideas aren't very good, and those ideas get made, or those, guys, th those ideas get put into process. And it's really frustrating. So I love to do this work because I want to see more of the people that have these great ideas be able to really pitch them in a way that they, 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 they get to see their ideas come to life. Now, before I go into the specifics, I just want to ask you or some of you what it is about pitching or just trying to get your ideas across that's challenging for you. Anything? Yeah. Right, right. You thought you had an hour, you have 10 minutes. Yeah, good. Just unwilling to take risks. Um, very traditional mindset. Okay. Pitching a, a non right. Pitching somebody who doesn't really see exactly what this, this idea could be. Or inside that box. Okay, great. What else? Yeah. I get really excited and random. Okay, so just for yourself, it's like you get really excited and then you're all over the place. Your, your ideas just go kind of randomly. Okay, good. Sometimes there's a preconceived idea that's already in their head, so you're not only pitching a new idea, but you're trying to kind of break the mold of what they see. Right, unpitch an idea, right, exactly. A lot of times it's true. I mean, people come in already kind of having their minds made up, and part of your job is to get them excited about this new idea and kind of change that around. So good. What else? Anything else? Right, on the people that, that your listeners. The hard, the hard part, there's really nothing you can do about that. You know, they, they are what they are. What you can do is not let that get in your way in getting your ideas across. Because a lot of times when that happens, it just tightens you up and your mind gets really, really stale. Anything else is challenging about pitching ideas or communicating what you think are really creative ideas? All right. So, this first idea, and it's the foundation of communicating anything in a way that you're going to either motivate or inspire people. And that's a state of mind. You know, Michael Phelps, pretty good swimmer. On the Olympics, in the Olympics, when he was on the block and he was ready to, 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 to swim, do you think the tape that was running in his head was, I'm not really very good. These other guys look really muscular. They're really better swimmers than I am. I don't think I should actually be up here. People are going to find out I'm a fake, etc. Probably not. What was going on inside his head? What tape was running? I'm the best. right? I'm going to win a gold medal. I'm going to win a lot of gold medals, whatever it is. The first thing that, that any successful person, whether it be an athlete, whether it be a performer, or, or somebody who's in a creative field, is your state of mind. You have got to adopt a state of mind that literally is, I am the best. My ideas are brilliant. I have incredible ideas. Any other tape that runs is not going to do you any good, and it's definitely not going to, to, to do your listener any good. Because we do have those voices in our head, the, that cacophony that's literally destroying you. It's criticizing you. It's saying, you're stupid. Why did you say it? Like you were talking about rambling. It's like, where are you going? You're an idiot. You're not making any sense. <laughs> Please come back. And you lose it. 
And nobody, and you know this for yourself, if you go into a meeting and somebody's pitching an idea or if somebody's just communicating anything within your organization, you don't want to see them be nervous or you don't want to see them faltering or you don't want to see them not excited about what they're talking about. You're kind of almost praying, like, when I get there, please just let, let this person really be excited about their idea and put it out in a way that I can really understand it. Now, when I say you, they don't want to to see you be nervous or you don't want to see somebody be nervous. It's like you can't not be nervous. It's just not going to ever happen. So anybody who says, yeah, I get a lot. Yeah, who gets a little anxious when you have to pitch an idea or you have to talk to a group of people in any kind of group? Right. Good. All human beings here. Good. <laughs> it is the natural order of things. It's called separation anxiety. As soon as you take an animal outside of its group, it starts to flip out because it's separate. And since we're kind of herding animals, if you take one of us and you, you separate it from the group, what happens to it? In, back in the Stone Ages? Die. You die. You get your, your lunch, right. You get your, your, the next meal. So it's just, it's kind of a hardwired thing. So you're never going to get rid of it. What you can do is you can use that energy and change it from fear to excitement or from nervousness to enthusiasm. And you can do that. It's just, once again, it goes back to this mind state. Anybody who's a good athlete, there's a lot of adrenaline going on. There's a lot of nervousness before they start the process. As soon as they do, that energy gets funneled. So start listening to the voices in your head. Not, not while you're actually presenting, but do it beforehand. And just see what is running. If it is anything other than, this is great information. This is really great information. This is a great idea. This is a great concept. Then you are doing yourself and your listener a, dis a disservice. It's just not going to work. You're, you're sabotaging from the beginning. So there's, there's really four, four basic elements. The human con connection or authenticity. Human connection, that's, that's the major thing. If you don't really feel like you connect with somebody, it's very difficult for you to agree with their ideas. You know, it's, you know, it's very hard for them to even open their mind because they want to feel like, wow, you've, you've got just incredible ideas. Wow, wow got bright. It's <laughs> nice. I like that. Now I can see you. So the idea when I talk about human connection and authenticity, it, it go dark again. Is, is not so much, you know, because it's such a weird concept to say, oh, I'm going to be authentic. It's hard to be just authentic. What you can do is if you literally make your listener the most important thing in that room and you really get excited for them, and I almost kind of think of it that you're serving your listener. Every time you're talking to anybody, it could be your wife, it could be your girlfriend, it could be your children, it could be anybody, that you're literally serving them. And if you take that attitude that it's not about you at all, it's literally about them and making that connection. That will help a lot. And it will help a lot with any nervousness that you feel. Because the nervousness comes from, I hope I'm not going to screw up. I hope I get this right. I hope I don't do this. Or I don't blow it. Well, you know what? It's not about you. It's about your listener and your idea and hopefully putting them together. So when I say the human connection, that means just be yourself in the sense of once again, running that idea in your head that you're, that, that you're really brilliant and you've got some really exciting information and you, you're, you cannot wait to give it to these people. And that takes that arrow away from how am I doing to more how are they doing. Is this helping them? Is this, is this serving them in some way? Is this adding value to them? So keep that focus out there. That will help a lot. Enthusiasm. I mean, clearly, I'm sure you've, you've all seen people that, that talk about their ideas, and it sounds like they are so bored with their own ideas. Why would you get excited? They're the expert. They're bored. Let me see. What should I be? I'll be bored because I'm just going to mirror what you are. Now, I don't mean be over the top ridiculous enthusiasm. I mean realistic enthusiasm. You're excited about your ideas. So you want to really, truly get excited about what it is that you're talking about. Not fake it, but literally get in touch with what is it about your idea, your concepts that you really are jazzed about. And then the delivery part, which I'll talk about some of the skills specifically that really impart a sense of confidence and, and, and capability that you want to play with. Because how you deliver it really does make a difference. 
you know, there's been a lot of, of speakers mentioning uh, Barack Obama and, you know, the, the idea that he really manifested change and, and was elected in, a, in, a, in a, a very important time in history. Well, it's really interesting if you think about how he got elected, right? He's a minority and he had very little political experience, correct? So how come we voted for him? How did he get into office? Delivery. I mean, it was. He created this sense of confidence and inspiration and, and truth and honesty in a way that we just went, we got to go with that guy. So a lot of it does come down to delivery. I mean, I wish that wasn't true, but it is true. So you want to really deliver your message in a way that you look like you know what you're talking about. You look like you are really amazing, gifted, talented, whatever that is and especially confident and credible. Because if you don't look confident or sound confident, then I, I can't be confident with you. So I'll just talk about some really basic delivery skills. And then this idea of simplifying concepts. Like somebody said, you know, you, you, they, they give you an hour and then you, you've only got 10 minutes. Or you, you, you're going all over the place. Or just time in, in general. There's never enough time to put all my ideas in, into this one half hour, hour, 10 minute session. You got to keep your ideas really, really simple and easy to follow. Because when you get really complicated, it's really hard to get the essence of what you're trying to say. So part of your job is to boil it down. I mean, literally, just give them what they need. Not what you want to give them, but what do they need to hear? What is it that they have to, to know keeping it simple so that they can take that and go, yeah, I understand it. Because a lot of times when you talk about the listener, <laughs> they can't think outside of the box or they can't get it. Yeah, they can't. And a lot of times it's because you're so all over the place with this idea that it's really difficult to kind of follow and get to the basis of what you're really doing or what you're talking about. So bring it down. Really boil it down to the essence of what that idea is. It, it, hopefully, if you get them really excited, they're going to ask you lots of questions, and that's when you can get into talking into the details even more and more. But, but your job is to really get them motivated, excited, and, and inspired. That's, that's the major key. So, I really I can't stress this enough. I want your, your attitude, your enthusiasm level to be along these lines. That your idea is brilliant. That it is incredibly valuable to the, this group of listeners. And lastly, that you're really excited about sharing it with them. And that just kind of turns all those inward elements and it turns it out to what you're really doing there. You do have a great idea. You do want to share it because it is valuable. And you are excited about that. So start just, once again, paying attention to what voices are going in there and just start playing that. I mean, literally, for those of you, you know, familiar with The Secret or Affirmations or Laws of Attraction, this is part of that. I mean, you have got to adopt this attitude because that's what you're doing. You're trying to motivate and inspire people. So get out of your own way. Quit thinking about you. Start thinking about them and really kind of savor the opportunity to talk to people. And you might think, oh, yeah, but it's the VP or it's, the, you know, it's somebody who's powerful. Or this person's really got a bad attitude and they've got their arms crossed and they're looking at me and they kind of scare me. Yeah, okay, great. You don't know anything about that person. You don't know that they're absolutely enthralled with you. They just happen to look at you in a different way or they just happen to challenge you because they're excited about your idea. You don't, you don't know that. It's not your job. Your job is just to keep going. To literally just keep engaging, keep engaging them. They're all people. I mean, a lot of times it's the, the senior people in companies just scare us. Well, th th they probably have friends. They <laughs> probably. Some, some of them we know do not, actually. Some of them have children. Some of them were children. <laughs> you know. So... They're human beings, and you can't just allow that idea that, you no, know, they're, 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 they've turned into this kind of robot or this monster. No, they're, they're, they're people. Connect with them. And we connect with people that come from a real, real passionate place, period. I, I lived in Venice, for, Venice, California, for years, and every time 
friends would come down, we'd, we'd, I'd take them down to the boardwalk and look at all the different interesting people that were down there and all the different acts. And there was this one time when there was a kid, maybe 10 or 12 years old, horrible singer and guitar player. Horrible. I mean, it was like watching an accident. But he was doing it from a place that was so, he was just so excited about it. You could tell. It wasn't showing off. It wasn't, you know, putting on an, an act. He literally loved what he was doing. And we stopped there and we watched him for about five minutes. It was bizarre. We gave him money, put it in his hat, and walked on. A little bit farther down the road, by the uh, Fig Tree Cafe, there was a uh, gentleman playing violin. Obviously, he was concert level trained his whole life. Had the pad on his chin, so, you know, this very serious. But he was kind of phoning it in. And I think you know what that, what that is. You know, going through the motions, but really that, that connection to what he was doing wasn't there. And we literally walked right by that person, kind of made a mention, oh, that, that's beautiful, but kept going. And later I thought, that's really interesting. We stood and gave our full attention to somebody that was horrible at what they were doing. And then we walked by somebody who was really wonderfully trained. And it just hit me again. It's like, yeah, because that person was just coming from a really true, authentic place, and they were excited about what they were doing, and that's it. We all respond well to that kind of enthusiasm, that kind of excitement. So start running this. Just, I mean, before you go into a pitch, before you go into a meeting, just start going, wow, this, I'm so excited. I'm, you know, I'm, oh, I'm nauseous. That's good. I'm really excited, you know? <laughs> my heartbeat, I can feel it in my veins and my head. That's great. You're really excited. Because you've never passed out, right? Has anybody passed out when you have to pitch an idea? No. Have you ever died? It'd be horrible if somebody responded. It, it doesn't happen. It's just adrenaline. Oh, let me go into a, a real quick little uh, nutritional thing here. Who drinks coffee? All right. Of those people who drink coffee, how many people get nervous before you have to talk to a group of people, right? Okay. Coffee is a... Stimulant, right. Don't drink it. Because what you're doing is you're just juicing your, your adrenals, and you're, you, you thought you were nervous. You're going to be a lot more nervous when you get the caffeine pumping through you. And some people say, oh, I can't get going unless I have my coffee. Yeah, adrenaline will get you going. So just trust that process. Try not to do that. Try not to eat most of the things you put into meetings, which is rolls, Sweet rolls, bagels, all that sugar. It's just in a solid form. As soon as you eat it, it goes right into sugar, jacks you up. And then about 15 minutes later, the, the blood sugar comes out because of the, the insulin. And now you can hardly think <laughs> because your brain works on glycogen and you don't have any. It's kind of, I mean, have you ever had that where you, you, you've been working on this presentation for three weeks and all of a sudden you can't remember your own name? It's because you, you don't have the chemicals that you need. So try and avoid that. Literally, protein. Like, before I came, I had for lunch, I had, went over to this little sidecar thing. What do you call them? Yeah, street me. I had street, I had street me. That is, that sounds bad. It wasn't dead. Street kill. So I just had chicken. That's it. So I just had that, and, and protein really digests well. It brings your blood sugar up really nicely and stays that way. You'll be very alert. You won't, be, you won't have that adrenal rush from just the sugar, and it literally just keeps you at a, in, a, in, a, in a, a real nice energy level, and it just kind of balances you out. So if you can, just any kind of protein works really well. So eggs, bacon, meat, whatever you want. All right. Vegetarian, right? I don't know what you can do. Beans. <laughs> All right. And this idea of trusting and, and credibility. If you, how important is it when you're talking to somebody that they trust you and are confident with you? Very important. If they don't trust you and they're not confident that you know what you're talking about, they won't listen to you. They may be looking at you and nodding and even smiling. They are not listening to you because they've already made up their mind. People make up their mind in about 15 to 20 seconds. Now, this is first impression. If they've known you for a long time, you, you've obviously changed that. But first impressions, 15 to 20 seconds, they'll decide whether or not they trust you, believe you, think that you're competent in what you're doing. And there was a Professor Albert Moravian years ago that did all these studies on communications. And what, what he wanted to find out was this idea of how do people determine whether they trust and believe somebody when they first meet them. And he came up with what he calls the three Vs. This, this is all there is, verbal, vocal, visual. Ver, verbal is the words, what you say. Vocal is the sound of your voice. 
and the visuals, everything they see. Eye connection, facial animation, body language, the way you're dressed, whatever it is. And when he looked at it to see what has the, the most weight or what has the most impact on this idea of really establishing trust and belief, he found that the visual element is the most important, followed by the vocal and then the content, which is kind of interesting. It doesn't mean the content's only 7% important. What they did with this study is he did an inconsistent message. If I got up here and said, uh, welcome everyone, very excited to be here. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to look out at your faces and see that there is a lot of enthusiasm for what I think we both, you know, it's like, okay. <laughs> it doesn't matter what you say. If you read that in an email, you go, oh, wow, this looks pretty interesting. But if you listen to what I do to it visually and vocally, it's, no, I don't believe you. I don't, you, you don't look happy. You don't sound happy. You're not happy. So the idea is you want a consistent message, meaning this doesn't break down at all. I listen to you. You sound like you know what you're talking about. You sound excited. Your ideas are there. It's great. So you have to have the verbal. You have to have the, the, the content. But you also have to put it out there in a way that establishes trust and belief. Otherwise, that's it. Forget about it. Now, like I said, the more you get to know somebody, obviously that changes. So over time, somebody's brilliance will come out. I mean, it, you'll, you'll see that. But why waste that time? Why not just come across right away always like, wow, this person really knows what they're talking about. They're good. They're enthusiastic, etc. These are, these are not the most powerful skills, but they do have an impact. Dress and appearance, just the way you put yourself out there. In a creative environment, you need to be creative. In a corporate environment, you have to be a little bit more corporate. But whatever the, the culture dictates, you want to match. Because I'm not going to go give a presentation to an agricultural society in a, in a three-piece suit, two-piece suit. What am I talking about? Do they even, how old am I? It's got really old three-piece suit. Yeah. But you're not. You're, I'm not also going to go out in overalls. You're always going to dress a little bit above what you think that, that, that situation calls for because it's really easy to, to dull it down by rolling up sleeves, unbuttoning things, taking off jackets, et cetera. But it, but it has an impact, the, and, and especially for women also. I mean, women in business, you, you have much more choices around color and fashion and style, and you've got to be careful with that because it can be distracting if there's too much going on. And then you get into the, you know, the, the, the sexual elements of it. You know, if, if you are dressing in a way that is sexy, then that's what people are going to notice. So it will be distracting for people, for me anyway. <laughs> so <laughs> Distracted all day today. <laughs> Horrible. So posture just means how you stand or you sit. How you hold yourself, people, people will, will, will make an impression on it. They'll, they'll make a judgment based on it. If I stand like this and I have my hands in my pocket and I'm talking about what supposedly is a really valuable idea, what's the, what's the subtle message I'm giving you? Really yeah, I don't really care. I don't believe it. Yeah, it's like, yeah. Or if I stand like this and I have my hands in front of me and kind of rolled over, what's the impression? I have to go to the bathroom, right? <laughs> Timid, shy. Yeah. I mean, there's all kinds of different, different things. You can't think, oh, people, they won't make much of it. We, may, we are hardwired for this kind of stuff. We can tell the mood of a friend of ours walking two blocks away. It's, it's, it's just all hardwired for us. So make sure that it's, it's all about choice. It's not about doing things a certain way. What it is about is being conscious of the impact that these things have and making choices that create the kind of impre impression that you want to make. So if you want to be real casual and create a real casual kicked back kind of feel, yeah, sit on the edge of a table, that's fine. But just know that that's the impression that's coming out. We usually talk about just a, a real neutral stance. We have your weight balanced evenly on both feet, your arms relaxed at your sides when you're not gesturing, and it just creates a nice, very open, comfortable, confident stance. Most people will get into some kind of a kind of an energy block thing where we're, our hands will come up and we'll wring our hands or we'll put our hands behind our back or we will put our hands in front of us. Well, it's not a big deal, but it does create kind of a, a feeling that you're holding something back. There was a guy in Texas year, years ago that about every three or four seconds when he was thinking about what he was going to say, he'd go, so it was 1962. Uh, <laughs> we were down on there. It's like, okay, you know, and I... It's really, really... When he saw himself on video, he was like completely appalled. He'd been doing that for his whole life. It's like, 
hard to listen to you when you do that. So just be careful when you're seated. You know, if your energy's up and forward, people are going to be engaged with you. If it's kicked back and it's laid back, then, uh, then it looks like you're not engaged. So all they'll do is they'll mirror that. Just know that. So it does have an impact. Movement. If you're in a moving situation where you can move and you're not behind uh, a lectern or you're at a table, you, want, you do want to move. And the reason you move very simply, you want to engage your listeners. That's it. And if you're, you, even if you're at a seated situation, if you can stand up and write something on a board, it just it changes the environment of the room. It changes the energy, brings the focus back on you, and engages people. So if you can, move. And gestures. You want to gesture. People sometimes say, I don't know what to do with my hands. And when I was growing up, people said, don't use your hands. You look Italian or it's distracting. Or There's <laughs> no offense to Italian. I love the, the, the gestures. They're really good. They're, they're powerful. They, we are very visual creatures. We, well, I mean, you, that's, what you, you know, that's what you're all about. It's the visual element. So you want to gesture. You just want to make sure that your gestures are, are relevant to what you're saying and they're not just the same thing over and over, over again. The, the time the gestures become distracting is if they become kind of the same thing, where you just do this over and over and it's like, what are, you, what are you doing? So, you know, just think of any action word. If you need to move a project forward, if you need to try and encompass the whole element, if you need to, to really build on a foundation that you've already set, great. It's very easy. Most people will do little tiny gestures. We need to spread out over the entire region. feel safe. Start at the top, go to the bottom, you know, encompass it. It's like, no, you're going to say spread out. This is spread out. I don't mean you have to fling your arms and be crazy, but this is spread out, top, bottom. So make sure that the gesture matches what you're talking about. And then facial animation. People look at your face when you're talking to them. And you want to make sure that your face says what you're saying. Most of the time, we don't smile very much. Even though this is a great idea, I'm very excited about being here, I'm really enthusiastic, but you're not smiling at all. So I look out and say, I'm very excited to be here. <laughs> Brings me great joy to look at your faces. No, it doesn't. I mean, it doesn't matter what I say. So you, you do want to smile. When you do smile, it doesn't mean you, you, know, you smile like a grin and hold it there and look like an idiot. It literally means bring it up, let it go. So you might just smile for a second and then let it go and just keep talking. What does a smile say? If I bring up a smile, what's the, what's the impression you get off of that? Friendly? Excited? Confident? They're also contagious. And they're contagious, right, because people will actually smile back at you. Because it looks like you're actually enjoying yourself. It looks like you're, you're relaxed, you're comfortable, you're enjoying yourself. They're going to enjoy that a lot more. So you don't have to fake it, but it's easier to bring up that smile when you're talking about benefits or positive things. If you're talking about, this is really great, you know, this is going to have such an impact on our business next year, let it come out in your face. Enjoy that. Let, let, let's see some expression. And you can even practice looking in a mirror and literally say, I'm going to take a different way home today. It's like, I'm just kind of say, you don't have to say that, but you look at your face and see, what does that look like? Or if you have a video camera, look into it and just say a couple things with a smile and see the impact that has. It's, it's amazing. I mean, you think about babies, you know, because, you know, little, little Nikolai. When he smiles, the whole room goes crazy. Oh, he's smiling. He's smiling. Who cares? <laughs> baby. He probably just has gas or something. He's not smiling. But everybody loves the fact that they're smiling. That's, we love that. You're walking down the street. Somebody says good morning and smiles. It's like, oh, wow, what a great day. You know, as opposed to somebody that walks by and it's like, you say good morning, it's like, all yeah, right. <laughs> so we, we, we love it. We love that. So, get, you know, share that. You know, once again, be aware of the, of the listener. What do they need? What do they want? Any questions on these kinds of skills? These are the most powerful skills. Eye connection is the most powerful skill. What happens when we're talking to more than two people? Now, one-on-one, -on -one, we're very comfortable. When we're talking to somebody, I just look at you and we talk. Very, very comfortable. You know, we're easy with that. It's very relaxing. It connects us. When we get to a group, what happens is we've been told you're supposed to look at people when you talk to them, right? So if I'm talking to these people, my, idea, my eyes get all over the place. They're kind of darting. Or if I'm looking at a group like this, it's like, oh, my God, there's a million people. So I've got to keep going. Well, if you internally ask me, you know, what was your internal experience there? Were you looking at people when you were talking to them? I'm going, yeah, I looked at everybody. I was looking at everybody the whole time. Okay, if you ask you, what was your experience of Terry? Did he look at you? It's like, no. 
And the impression, what, what does this look like if I'm doing this with my eyes a lot? What, what kind of an impression could this make? Shifty. Shifty, right. Very shifty. Not trustworthy. Scattered all over the place, except whatever it is. So what you want to do is when you're talking to more than one person, you, you, want to, you want to just realize there is no such thing as a group. There is no such thing as a group. Four or five people sitting here, they're going to go out and go in different directions. They are not going to go together. So there is no group. This is not a group of people. These are a lot of individuals in this room at, at the same time. So what you want to do is individualize the group. And the way you do that is with your eyes. So if there were, say, the four of you here, I would, I would give a sentence to you. And then I would turn my head and I would give a sentence to you. Then I would turn my head and I would give a sentence to you. And if I'm talking to this group, what I've been doing is I'll look at somebody back there. I can't even really see you, but I'm going to talk to you until I finish that sentence. And I'm going to look over there and I'm going to connect. Then down here, I can actually see faces, so I'm going to connect in that way. Because what that does is a couple things. It makes me look much more confident because I'm looking people in the eye. And, you know, that whole idea that, you know, the, the person wouldn't look me in the eye. Well, when you look somebody in the eye, you, you look very confident. It also helps you keep your train of thought because when I'm looking at you and talking, it helps me kind of remember that I'm actually communicating ideas. I'm not just up here in my own head kind of trying to get these things out in a way that makes sense. I'm actually trying to communicate them to you. So it helps me stay focused. It actually will relax you. At first it feels really weird because we're so used to it that if I look at one person, it's like, oh, there's a person there. <laughs> it's good. You want, you want to make that connection because what it does is it'll relax you. Because like I said, you know, we're comfortable one-on-one. -on -one. I have no problem looking at somebody one-on-one. -on -one. Well, when you start doing this and you start to go, oh, no, you're a person. Okay, great. This relaxes me. I'm not talking to a big group because I'm not. I haven't talked to a group of people in 25 years. I'm talking to you right now, period. Everybody else is gone. Now I'm talking to you. Everybody else is gone. It helps me just relax and stay focused on what I'm doing, which is trying to communicate my ideas to individuals. Very, very powerful. So you look more confident. You look more comfortable. It helps you relax. It helps you stay focused on what you're talking about. And it engages your listener. I mean, if I look at you, you're going to be engaged. And in the days of, of texting, when you're in a meeting, how many people do you think of that meeting are actually not texting? You know, two, maybe? I mean, there's so many distractions that if you're not looking at people, it's real easy for them to go, oh, okay, yeah, 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 kind of start down, get, you know, and they're, they're not hearing a word you're saying. You need to keep engaging, keep bringing them in. So if I'm looking at you, you realize there's a connection, so even when I look over here, you know I'm coming back. So I can keep you engaged. So it's got all kinds of, of, of powerful elements to it. Play with it. Just play with it with friends and family at dinner tables with your children till you start to get the feel of it. And then when you're in a meeting, try it and see what it's like. I guarantee you it will relax you and it will make you look incredibly more confident and capable. Pausing and breathing is my favorite skill in the world. You look at any good speaker, and they are comfortable with silence. Everybody's got ums and uhs and you knows and okays or whatever that is. Why do we use those? Stalling, because why? We're thinking. Is it a bad thing to do to think? No. But we have this thing where we think, i got to keep talking no matter what. You know, even though I'm not sure what my next sentence is, I'll just start a sentence. <laughs> I hope it's going to make sense at the end. You know, it's like, no, it's not making sense. You should start that over. Because we're not giving ourselves any time. And what we do is we throw in ums and ahs because we think if we put an animal sound in there, that'll fool everybody. <laughs> no, what's going on. But the truth is, if somebody has a lot of ums and ahs, what do you think about them? They don't know what they're talking about. They're not prepared. They're not knowledgeable, etc. So what you want to do is be really careful with that. Get rid of, number one, the ums and the ahs, and the only way to do that is to get feedback from somebody. Anybody have children between the ages of 5 and 15? They're great. Just tell them, I'll give you a quarter for every time you hear me say, um, they will be on you, like, unbelievable. <laughs> you lose, like, $500 the first day, but then, then you, you buck up to the challenge. But you got to hear them because we don't hear them. They're, they're kind of white noise. We don't realize we're saying them. I, I can't even count the number of people who say, I don't really use them until they watch themselves on video, and it's like, oh, yeah, I do. And you want to get rid of them. Now, there can be, you know, occasionally there'll be one. But what you want to do is instead of saying an um, you want to pause and take a breath. Because that gives you air you need for your voice, number one. It also 
gives you the time to think about what you're going to say. And then the third thing, which is really valuable, again, looking at your listener, if I don't stop talking, does it give you a chance to actually think about what I've been saying? Can't, because I just keep going. It's like eating. You don't keep putting food in your mouth when you're eating. You have to stop. I know some of you don't, but you have to stop. I don't want to stop, Terry. You have to stop. And you need to chew it and you need to swallow it. That's what you have to do for your listeners. You have got to be quiet so they can, and it could be two or three seconds. It's not that long. It feels long up here, but it's not that long. And that pause really lets your listeners digest what you're talking about, put it back into their longer-term memory, and actually understand the concepts. Because a lot of times you'll get through a 30-minute presentation in 10 minutes. Good for you. You won. <laughs> but nobody understood anything you're talking about. They walked away and kind of like, oh, it's, it's a twister. So you have to give your listeners that opportunity to digest. So by eliminating the non-words, you look more prepared, more confident, more comfortable. By putting the pause in there, you allow your listener to digest the information. And most importantly, it allows you to actually think. Because you can see the difference. If I say, my name is uh, Terry Ward, and uh, I founded um, ComSkills Group uh, about uh, probably five years ago. And uh, before that, I had a, um, a, another company, an organization that... Uh, did a very um, similar, it's like, come on. <laughs> Are you making this all up? You know, <laughs> I don't even think you're Terry Ward now. As opposed to if I said, my name is Terry Ward. I started ComSkills Group about five years ago. Before that, I had started another organization and since sold, you know, just, just, just pause and breathe. It just looks like, wow, you know what you're talking about. Nice pacing, easy to follow, got your ideas. And that will help you to, like you're talking about, when you start to get excited and go all over the place, that'll help you actually keep editing. Because some people say, I wish I was more extemporaneous. You know the secret to being extemporaneous? Stop talking. Think. Pause. And you can get it. And mine works really fast, so you'll be able to do it really, really quickly. But start playing around with that. Get people to give you feedback on when you say the M's and us. And then start playing with that idea of saying a sentence or two and then being quiet. That was a 10 second pause. <laughs> Felt like two and a half hours to me. But you can see it's not that long when you're sitting there. So just be aware, it's a very, very powerful skill. If you look at anybody who's good, Barack Obama, great pauses. Clinton, really great pauses. Martin Luther King, great pauses. Mandela, great pauses. I mean, these, they know how to work that. It's my favorite skill. And the more you get used to it, the more it becomes this really relaxing place you can go back to. You can do a lot of things, too. You can pause when you turn over. If you notice, when every time I turn over visual aid, I just pause. Gives me a chance to get my thoughts together. Because what are you doing when I turn over a visual aid? You're looking at it. You're not looking at me. I can just be quiet, let you read it, let me think, boom, then I can come back out again. Or if I have to look at my notes, I'd be quiet. Come back out. So play with that pause. Incredibly powerful skill. Now the vocal variety, you've got two elements to the voice. You need the breath. It is a wind instrument, so you need to really breathe. That means... You know, when you breathe in, your gut comes out, you get a nice full diaphragm, and then you can use it to project your voice, to have enthusiasm in your voice. So everybody's got a full range in their voice. Upper tones, mid tones, lower tones. Upper tones are enthusiastic tones. Lower tones are authoritative tones. Mid tones are kind of monotonous. They're not much to them, pretty neutral. We get stuck kind of in the neutral areas. And you just have to go a little bit into the upper areas to, to actually get people to understand that you're, you're excited about something. Because I can say, I'm very excited about being here today. Doesn't sound like it. And all I have to do is go, I'm very excited about being here today. Oh, okay, I believe you. Or I'm very excited about being... That's too much. Bring it down. <laughs> you can. You can play around with the voice too much. But anything that goes into the upper tones, you know, to say, this has been a really terrific couple days. I'm very excited about being here in New York. I can't wait to actually share some of the information I learned. You know, it's like blah, blah, blah. I don't get you. 
but to say this has been a really pretty incredible couple of days and I'm, I'm very excited about getting back home so that I can share this information with some of uh, the people that I work with. I said, yeah, okay, good. I get a little bit there. So a little bit goes a long way. Play with it. Upper tones. Read out loud. Tape record yourself. Just read it flat. Then read it out again with enthusiasm. Read it out again with more enthusiasm. What you'll notice is when you think you're being real enthusiastic, you listen to it and go, wow, it's still kind of dead. It's pretty remarkable. You really have to push it a little bit more than you think. So just get some feedback that way, and you can really hear whether or not you're, you're matching the level of enthusiasm that you're actually feeling and that they're going to hear that. And the idea of of projection. You have to be heard. Now some people, when you talk about authenticity, some people have a really quiet or intimate style, which is fine. But you still have to be heard. So even if you're soft-spoken, you need to breathe and make sure that your voice at least goes to the last person that's out there. So I always try to speak, and I've got a, when you've got a room the size, you have a mic, you don't have to try and speak all the way to the back of the room because all it will sound like is I'm yelling because it's amplifying what I'm doing here. So I can talk just like I was going to talk to maybe 15 or 20 people. But if you've got a larger group, you have to speak up. And you've got to watch trailing off at the end of sentences. Because you might start off and say, I've got this really great idea. What we're going to do is we're going to combine several different elements that we did last year and it's going to really be terrific. <laughs> And, you know, and it just feels like every time you get to the end of your idea, it's like, eh, stupid, throw it out, you know, <laughs> stupid, throw it out, you know, it's like, it's hard to keep that rhythm. Keep it up. Don't let it trail off, because when you trail off, all it's, it, our impression is what you're saying isn't important because your, your voice doesn't have the energy anymore, and it can't go off. A lot of that is just breathing. A lot of people don't breathe when you're talking, when you're, because you're nervous, and what you're doing, and, and that whole idea of just keep going. So as soon as I get to the end of a sentence, I don't really take any time to breathe. And sometimes you think, you know, I should breathe now, but I think I can finish this sentence. I can't. I think I can. Got to okay. And then when you're done, you suck air so that you can keep going. And, but you're doing this kind of half to empty, half to empty. And you start to actually put your body in almost a state of shock because you're not getting the, the oxygen that you need. So your heartbeat picks up. And now you think you're really nervous. When you're really not nervous, you're just not breathing. So keep breathing. I mean, play with the idea of reading out loud, pausing at the end of a sentence, take a nice deep breath, and go ahead because the breath will relax you. The breath will give you the, the wind that you need for your voice. And by projecting the voice, you're going to say, what I have to say is important, number one, and I want you to hear it, number two. And if you're soft-spoken, that's fine. You don't have to be crazy with your voice. But you want to make sure that you don't trail off and that you do bring it to at least a level where people can hear you. And it sounds like, for you, you're really excited about what you're talking about. Because you have to work within your own style. Everybody in this room has their own unique individual style. If you try and change that style, it's like pulling a rubber band and letting go of it. It'll go right back to what it is. You never change. All you do is you take what's, what works for you, your authentic style, and you play with some of these skills so that it polishes and, and enhances what you're doing. And the idea of conviction in your voice. That's where we can tell. I mean, we can tell so much. You call a good friend, husband, wife, whatever, and say, how you doing? They go, fine. <laughs> One word, they're not fine, you're in trouble. <laughs> and you know it. And, and so words mean very little most of the time. It's what's going on within that. So if your voice sounds like you don't have a lot of conviction about what you're talking about, you don't have a lot of conviction. I don't have any other way as a listener to pick up your enthusiasm, commitment, confidence. The only way is through the way you deliver things. Are you looking at me? Are you holding yourself in a way that feels confident? Are, are you sounding confident? Are you pausing, taking your time because you're comfortable? Those kind of things really have a huge impact. Any questions on these? Am I doing that? Yes. With a voice? Yeah. You're always trying to fill the room so that even though maybe I'm over here and I'm, I'm talking and if, if we were if it was two or three people, people would go, well, Terry, you're really too much. But I need to, even though I'm over here, my energy has to go all the way. So you're filling, filling the space no matter where you are. So you can't like bring it around and, and up and down and all that because if I talk at what feels comfortable for me right here, this level, you can see that it goes out about six feet and dies. So when I turn out here, it's really not going over there. So 
you just always want to project your voice to the back of a room or to the if it's a if it's a table situation that you're filling the entire room with your voice not yelling it's just it's making sure that you've got that volume in your voice anything else yes right mm-hmm I, most of the time when they're doing that, it feels like they're checking out because they're giving you these little, mm, 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 you know, it's like, we're hurry up, go, 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 go. So it, it, it's tough. That's when I'll check in and kind of go, all right, you know, before I move on and ask a question, get, get them involved and see whether or not they're truly listening to what you're saying or just say, so, so far, how does this sound, you know, and see what they do say because it, it's, it's tough. You know, and sometimes people go, oh, I, I hate being asked questions or I hate people objecting or throwing really different. If they're asking questions or objecting to things, they're, they're, they're engaged. They literally are saying, hmm, I'm interested, but I, I don't, you know, I need more information, that sort of thing. So be careful. Always check in with your listener. Yes. Conference calls are weird. I had the idea of, of you're talking about video conferencing or the telephone? Just not conference. Really difficult. You, you, you have to make sure, use names a lot. Make sure that you say Jim or Steve or, or, or Mary or whoever's on the other end. Use their names so you keep bringing them in because they can't see your face at all. It's all vocal now. And then you want to make sure that, that you identify yourself when you're talking too. Because you ever do that when you're listening? You're, I'm not sure who's talking. You know? So it's like, who, how do I respond to this? So just say, this is Terry. Boom, you know, and say what you're going to say. That way it makes it much easier for them to kind of keep track of it. All right, anything else? Yeah. Um, you heard a lot of the things you're saying um, when you're standing, you know, like gestures and things like yeah. that. Now, when you walk into a room and for an interview and you're mixing with some people, well, they'll have seats. Right. Is, is it off putting, do you think, to say, well, I'd, I'd rather stand or I have a feeling you can, you think you can convey a lot while you're sitting? Yeah, you, you really can. It, it, when you're gesturing, things like you can't obviously go below the table. You don't want to go above your head. You don't want to go any bigger than your shoulders. So you can use this whole room and still keep it. It's just, it's just, it's the same level of energy contained. That's all it is. But sometimes, yeah, take advantage of the room. And, and you can be seated and then all of a sudden just stand up and put something on a, on a whiteboard or a flip chart. And you're already standing on it. You keep talking from that standing position and then maybe sit back down again. You know? So you can, you can play with both of them. But all these skills are the same, whether you're standing or seated, it's the same thing. All right. When you're talking, yeah. you want to know what you're going to say ahead of time. Yes. You don't necessarily want to sound rehearsed. Right. So what, how do you find that? Trust, trust yourself that you know this information. You do know it. What happens is we overlay this idea that we think, I have to know everything about this, and I have to have perfect recall when I'm talking to these people. No, you don't. You need to be okay with making mistakes and forgetting things, period. If you're not, you'll, your mind will tighten up and you will forget a lot more things. And you will come across as scattered. So you just have to know your stuff. Put a couple bullet words. I mean, I have, like, my notes, I'll put down five or six key words that will keep me on target and trust that I'll say what I'm going to say. I have never in my life talked to any group of people, sat down and went, nailed it, got everything. It's always like, why did I say that? That was stupid. Or, you know, I forgot completely to talk about this. Yeah, that's the nature of it. It's going to happen. It's a creative process. Speaking and listening are fully right brain functions. Reading and writing are fully left brain functions. So when you're putting together information, you're all left brain. You're putting it together. You're using the you know, PowerPoint, etc. Then you stand up and you start sit down and start to speak. You've shifted right brain. You haven't made very many connections to that left side. So you just have to trust. It's a creative process. If you're good, especially in a pitch, if you're good at getting people excited, they'll start asking you questions and let you know what they need to know. They're not going to just let you kind of go on and on and on. That's why the pause is really important also. So keep it simple. Keep it tight. This whole idea of, of ABCs of your message, just, you know, open each pitch you have with a really strong benefit. You know, 
regardless of how good your idea is, if it doesn't have a benefit to your listener, I don't care. You know, I really don't. What, wow, you're terrific. And this has nothing to do with what I'm trying to accomplish in my business at all. So if you can let them know that, wow, you've been thinking about what I'm trying to accomplish here. Great. And here's your idea that's going to help me do that. You've engaged me. So call me ABCs. The action is clear. I'd like you to understand that this concept, or I would like you to be really fully excited about this concept. That's the action you want. And I guarantee this is going to help us meet this, whatever it is that we're trying to do. It's going to, this is going to do it. And the reason it's going to do that is because it hits this, this, and this. So now let me share with you what that idea is. So you've what we called position the message for people. You've said it, so I understand why it's valuable for me, why I should listen to you, and how I should listen to you. So, you know, keep it nice and simple. I've got a couple in the back when you, when you leave. There's a couple of these what I call message planners that, that have this ABC section first. We use Post-its when we put things together. You'll see on, that, on the sheet that you can put Post-its in these little areas, and it works beautifully, and you can move things around. And then there's a composition page, which is the next, next part of it, which I'm not going to go into because it's pretty detailed. But... You know, pick up one of those message planners. There's a book in the back if you want that. And if anybody wants, I've got a handout about seven secrets to pitching. And if you want any more information on just how to, how to get better at this, just email me and I can send you information. You know, and I'll answer any questions you have about that. And I think it's, it's almost time. What is it, 420? Got about five more minutes. Let me... This is the planner. When I talk about simple ideas, you can see there's three key points. You need to, be, you need to try and narrow down your concepts you're going to talk to somebody about into three key elements. If you put too much in there, you're going to lose them. And people say, yeah, but I got a lot of information. Well, sorry, but a human brain is about this big and it contains very little information. <laughs> it cannot do it. It's like getting a glass of water and pouring the water to the end and you go, well, yeah, but I got more water in the pitcher. I'm just going to keep pouring. Good. They may have made a mess. You're not going to get any more water in here. So don't think that because you got somebody in a room, it's your opportunity to tell them everything you've ever known about everything. Because <laughs> they're not going to get it. So what is it? What do they need? Go back to your listener again. Serve your listener. What do they need to know? What would really be helpful for them? What would really get them jazzed about this? And narrow it down. If you come up with one, two, or three key points. So you've got a strong opening with your ABCs in it. So you're establishing the context of the message, positioning it. Then you tell them, I'm just going to cover three very simple elements here in your pitch, whatever that is. Maybe just one. You go through it, and then you close it down again. So you have to remind them. So as you can see, this, this idea is incredible. It is going to help us to drive business in this direction, which is one of our goals for this next quarter. So I look forward to actually hearing back from you on ideas that we can do to move this forward and green light the project, whatever. But... If, if, if you want more information on this, I can email you information on just how to put together information. The key thing is, going back, going back to this. You've got to connect with people, and that just means you have got to connect with your information, your concepts, your ideas, and get excited about them and really make your listener the most important thing in that room. It's not you, and it's not your information. It's them. How can you add value to them? And if you focus that way, it has huge, huge impact on the connection you make and for you on getting out of your own way and really letting your ideas come out. Give yourself lots of room to make mistakes. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to trip over words. You're going to forget words. You know, like I did. I forgot the name of the street meat thing. So I'll have to remember. But it's okay. I don't, have to, I don't have to know it. It's like I go, what's that called? And then you tell me. And it's kind of a game then. You know, it doesn't matter. Don't put expectations on yourself that are going to do nothing but destroy you. And the more scripted you get, the more you're going to screw it up. Guaranteed. You memorize it, you're dead. You will be flat as a pancake. I won't hear a word you're saying. And if you script it so you're trying to memorize it, you're so in your own head, it's like, where are you? You know, I can't even feel you. And if I can't feel you, I'm not interested. I'm just not interested. And you know that. The people you're drawn to are the people that are just like, wow, they're authentic. That's why the Australians are so attractive. You know, they're, just, they're just themselves. 
See, I, later I'm going to think, why did you say that? <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> Offended the Australian people. It's going to happen. So, and enthusiasm, keep your enthusiasm going. Get that, get that tape inside your head that just says, man, my ideas are great. I can't wait to share them with you. This is wonderful. Literally, this will change your life. Just this one element. Run that tape. Run it all the time. Every time you have a conversation, every time you write an email, every time you write, you leave a voicemail. This message should be in the background. So what your listener always hears is, wow, that person's brilliant. They've got great ideas, and they're excited about sharing them with me. And then delivery. Look at this idea of eye connection. Start individualizing. Pause and breathe. Get some feedback from people on when you're saying non-words or if you're you know, going and going and going and going. Have them just say breathe. It's like, all right. And then simplify your concepts. Keep them nice and simple. Don't what we call data dump, or don't just back the truck up and dump all your information on them. Be aware of what their needs are and what they can do. So any last questions before I wrap it up? Yes. Yeah. If you don't know the answer, with confidence and bravado, say, I don't know, and I'll find out for you. Boom, you're off. <laughs> what are they going to do? No, you're supposed to know. I don't know, but I don't know, and I will find out for you. I know. I know I should. I don't, and I will find out. I know exactly who I'm going to call. I'll get back to you. <laughs> And if somebody really objects to you, acknowledge it. If they say, you know, I think this whole idea of gesturing is stupid and, and it's going to make me look ridiculous in my meetings. You don't want to go, well, that's, you're an idiot and, you know, that's not true. I've been doing this my whole life. And just literally say, you know what, I think it is important that you're, you make sure that whatever you do in any communication situation isn't going to put you in a position where you're going to be judged. So all these skills, I want you to, you know, so just acknowledge it. Because what are they going to do? Go, what? but you... you Oh, I can't get them now because, you know, there's nothing to grab onto, so just acknowledge. Uh, yes? Um, going back to the facial expression and gesturing, I noticed that when a female speaker um, speaks, she tends to kind of like pause for a second. Right. Yeah, I think just women in general have to be a little bit more careful because it is, quote, you know, business is a world of, of, of men or masculinity. It's changing every day, thank God. But you just want to watch anything that will diminish your, your impact, and men too. Some people will smile out of nervousness. So it, it's really not a smile that says I'm comfortable. It's a smile that says I'm not comfortable. So if that's happening, yeah, bring it down. But don't eliminate it, because a lot of women I've seen swing all the way over, and it's like, yikes, you know, you're not even a human now. You know, you become like a cardboard cutout of what you think you're supposed to do. Now bring yourself back, but watch it. That's why videotaping yourself anytime you get a chance and really taking an objective viewpoint and saying, how is that coming across is really valuable. Yes? Yeah. Part of it, 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 you, it depends on what, your, what, what parameters you want to set. If there's information you have to get out of the way, that you have to get through because it's the last time you're going to have, say, a group together, say that up front. Say, I need to get through this information, so I want you to hold questions till the end. Always give a section for questions because people will have them. Now, that's if you have a time constraint. Otherwise, I always like to have people ask questions because they're telling me what they want to know. Instead of me going, no, here's what I'm going to tell you. Forget what you want. Here's, I've already discussed this with myself, and I know what you need. No. What is it that they want? So when they're asking questions, it breaks the wall, so it's not like me up here, you over there. It, that's why I start off with questions. I want to break it down. I want this to be more of a conversation. It's not a speech. It's not a talk. It's literally communicating. So I, I would suggest if you're comfortable with it, get it. Get them going. Have them ask you questions. Ask them questions. Try and get it more conversational. It breaks that bond. Yeah. I'm curious what your thoughts are on the use of uh, NLP for supporting clients. You know, for me, I like simple. And, and you, you can get so caught up in some of the elements, unless you're really good at it and really can, can do it very quickly, it can distract you from what's really going on, which is the human connection. I try to avoid anything that's really going to manipulate or it's going to sway in some way that's just not it. I, I just want to connect with somebody, get excited with them, and, and share that information. So 
I'm, I'm not much for that kind of thing, but I know it's very valuable and a lot of people do use it. So if you're good at it and it's something you can do immediately, great. And if it's going to help you. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, neural linguistic programming kind of, you know, matching people's body language, uh, watching what they do with their eyes, you know, lots of, lots of different elements to it. But unless you can really split focus, sometimes it just it gets in the way of you just actually making a sincere con connected effort. Now, there are times in, in, in negotiations and, and things like that, definitely very, very powerful. But in a negotiation, sometimes you're trying to get the upper hand. In, in a presentation or a pitch, uh-uh, I just want you, I want you on with me. I just want you excited. I want you to hear my ideas. Anything else? Yes? If you can avoid having it, I mean, you should really be talking to them. It, it, sometimes they make you do that, and you have to. If you do, say, please bear with me. I'm going to walk you through this. Take the pieces out as I ask you to and try not to go ahead. It just makes this meeting more, be more effective for you, not me, for you. If you can, just say, I've got this great handout at the end that I'm going to give you that has everything that I've talked about. I will reference a couple pieces during the meeting so that you'll know what to look for and, and do that. The more I can just keep you with me, that's what I want. I don't, I don't want to get it too involved. Yeah. Stop! Done. Stop! Yeah, <laughs> done. I, I don't know how many times I've seen that. I was like, yeah, I know. Thank you, but you, it's so exciting. It's like, I forget it. If you got to keep your object, objective in mind. If your objective is to get to the yes, stop at the yes. Yeah, just stop. Just say, God, this is great. You know, and you can even say, I, I'd love to set another meeting up afterwards so I can share this great information, and they can do it or not do it at that point. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's really hard. Number one thing is start your eye connection from the beginning. I mean, what happens a lot of times is you're, you're scattered and everybody goes, oh, good, they're not looking at me, and then they go in. And then it's hard to bring them back. But if you start right away looking, and I'm bringing you in, and I'm bringing you in, then all of a sudden it's harder for them to do that. And you can't put people on the spot and say, everybody put your blackberries down. You know what? Too late. Now, if it's a meeting and you are in a position where you can say, everybody, blackberries. Put them on the table. I don't want you using them. If, if, if this time isn't valuable to you and you, can, you have something better to do, then you should go do that. Right now, I want you in the room. It's hard to do now because everybody's kind of split-braining, but sometimes it's, just, it's valuable to set a ground rule. And not because it's you. Once, you oh, sorry. Once again, what you want to do is you want to say, I want this meeting to be as valuable as I can for you. And what I've noticed is sometimes texting can get in the way so I'm suggesting, and I want to know if this would help you, and this would make it more valuable for you, is if we had people put their Blackberries away for the meeting. Or any other ideas or suggestions that you have that would make this a more productive meeting for you. And then they'll go, oh, yeah, that would be good. Great. Now, you, now you're not the one who's the police person, but you can say, all right, then I'll, I'll, I'll keep that boundary, and if anybody gets on their Blackberries, I'll remind them not to. And bring it out. Yeah. Right. Right. Once again, you got to manage the group because it is a group. It's not that person. So if it's clear that they're just being antagonistic or they're just really talking about things that are specific to them and their business unit or whatever it is, then you can very easily say, you know what? Let me just check in. I think you know. You obviously have a lot of questions and a lot of concerns, and I definitely want to deal with them and I want to get into it. I'm just not sure if it's a good use of everybody's time to go in that direction. <laughs> so I'd love to afterwards, why don't we stay and we can talk it through. In the meantime, what I want to do is make sure that we get everybody involved. You know, it's the truth. And everybody goes, oh, I'm glad you did that. <laughs> Rather than 20 minutes later, they're going, can she control this person? You know, what is going to go on? So do it. And you can check with the group and just say, you know what, is this a good use? Should we go in this direction? They'll go, no, we, you know, do it like so Okay, good. So you're not putting them down. You're not shutting them down. It's for the good of the group. You're always managing the group. It's your, it's your job. It's your responsibility. All right. Now it is, yeah, it's past time. So like I said, I've got some business cards in the back. If anybody does want that seven secrets, my email is tward at comskillsgroup.com. 
send me an email or drop your business card in the bowl back there and I will get that to you and, and any information that you need. All right. Have fun.